We're here, we're here on WMFRadio.com, and we're sitting down with uh, gubernatorial, which is just a fun word to say, it uh, candidate for Governor Evan Falchuk, and we're happy to have him here. And before the break, we were discussing some housing policy and jobs policy, and now... Speed round. Yeah, so we're going to get into the speed round. You know what the speed round is? If you don't know, it's we ask quick questions and get quick answers. That's right. We so grill it's, people. It's a tw- it's a twenty. It should be a quick. I ask you a question. You explain yourself within a minute and a half. If I say minutes. Snoop Dogg, you say likes to smoke weed. Yes, exactly. Kind of like that, only more candidate-y. All right. So <laughs> first, first question: As governor of Massachusetts, would you support uh, labeling of GMOs? I, yeah, I think labeling is a, is a good idea. People should know the kind of foods that they're eating. And people that are looking for that, look for it. You know, if you go to stores where they're paying attention to these issues, they're looking to see what's in your what's in your food. Awesome. Would you support the Democrats at the State House without uh, any hearing from medical patients to tax their medicine? Medicine should not be taxed. So, no. <laughs> good. Our corporation's people. I've never met a corporation. <laughs> Can I? I got to add to this though. Go ahead. I know it's speed round. No, but it's a- there there was a there, there was a resolution in the U.S. I'm sorry, in the in the state senate to declare that corporations are not people and that money is not speech, which is what everybody wants to see, right? You hear everybody talk about this. It did not come to a vote. They didn't even bring it to a vote in the mass legislature. So you, you tell me what's going on when you hear people in, in politics saying things about how, oh, money in politics is bad. They say it because they know it makes people happy to hear, but take a look at how they vote. Or in this case, they don't even vote. So that's, that's what has to change. Again, why I founded the United Independent Party, we need to fill up our legislature with people that will actually deal with this issue and not just talk about it. Awesome. You have another one, Frank? I do. How do you feel about the militarization of, of local police? It's a problem. I mean, this is the general problem we've got with the, with the drug war generally. Is it's a policy that has not worked. It's, it's incarcerating huge numbers of people. It's working in a way that disproportionately hurts communities of color. It's preventing people from getting opportunity. It's hurting people. Do you, do you go even further than, I, I know for cannabis that you support, Legalization to get out in front of this. It's going to happen. That's in your policy paper. What about other drugs? Do you go like uh, where law enforcement against prohibition goes, where they think that uh, we should rethink all drug laws and reform everything? Well, even we, cocaine we've got heroin? a lot of work to do on, on these issues because this is a serious problem that we just we, we treat purely as a law enforcement problem. So with these these harder drugs, for want of a better word, we're, we're not even dealing with the health care consequences of this. People need substance abuse help, and what ends up happening is that they end up being put in prison instead of getting medical treatment. This is bad. With, with marijuana, as we talked about, and as is on our website, at some point it's going to be legal. You know, Three it, years. It, 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 that may be when it is, and we can look at the experience of what's happened in Colorado and Washington, and in, in Washington, because it happened in that way, there's been almost no preparation for it mature good leaders are able to look to the future and say let's start planning for this let's figure out and there are a lot of things to deal with not just simple things like what price is it sold at and 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 how do you tax it how do you deal with the public health consequences how do you deal with educating young people about this now in a different way how do you deal with simple things like you see in, in colorado they're trying to figure out how do we figure out who's operating under the influence um how do we deal with um you know, the, you know, underage use and all these other issues that you, that's why we have a legislature. Our legislature prefers to pretend as if this issue isn't happening when it really is. Well, they have to get elected again in two years, right? So they, <laughs> they, they think that the best way to get elected is to say nice things that sound good and keep kicking the can down the road. And, and the trouble is there, you can do that for a little while, but it's like anything else that you do in your life. If you don't take care of your, your body physically, at some point that bill's going to come due. And in our politics, that's what's happening. How do we fix the T? How do we fix this uh, MBTA? Is the, the, the money situations, the service situation, it just seems like the, uh, we know the fares are going to continue to rise. How do we fix the T issue and the transportation it, it is issue? enormously underfunded. The, the governor did a good thing, Governor Patrick, last year when he tried to pass a, a transportation law that would deal with a lot of these issues. Unfortunately, and this has become normal in American politics, he announced it in a way that was a surprise to everybody in the legislature. He announced it in, in the state of the state address. Imagine that. And the leaders in the House and the Senate were like, well, hold on a second. You know, what, what are you talking about? This is a huge deal, and you didn't even talk to us about this. So immediately they were at 
odds with each other. So they fought, and we ended up with a law that funded about half of what is needed and no political will to do anything more about it. So if you care about the T and making sure we've got a world-class public transportation system, or even that we have a pretty good world uh, <laughs> public transportation system, we need to have leaders that are willing to say, how do we make choices? So think about this. There's lots of public companies, really profitable companies, that get huge tax breaks from the state. Intel, great, great company that makes wonderful things like in your computer over here, probably the chip in there. They got a $300 million tax break from the state of Massachusetts to keep a factory open that they ultimately ended up closing anyway. Imagine how much good that could have done with the MBTA or with education or early childhood education or helping seniors that are going bankrupt because they can't afford what it takes to be in a nursing home. We've got a a system that the priorities are completely skewed. Make no mistake about this MBTA problem. When When they underfunded transportation spending, one of the things that ended up happening was they raised fares on the T. Well, who rides the T? It's not the people that have the money to lobby against that. It ends up being another impact on the people in the middle and the bottom rungs of the ladder. This is happening in a state where we think of ourselves as the most progressive state in the country. So would you support that youth pass? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. All these things, though, have to be part of a, this, a, a comprehensive strategy of smart growth, Build more housing of, of multifamily kind that people can afford to live in that's near transit. Sure, give people a youth pass. But those extra few bucks are helpful, but not as helpful as it would be to really significantly lower the cost of living. So you're saying spread the, the tea further out into the suburbs and at the stations, build smart growth around them. You, it, it, the, the lines are where they are at this point. I mean, you see how hard it is to extend out the South Coast Rail, which is a really important priority. We've got to do that. And there should be lots of building that happens in smart, coordinated ways along the, the, um, the commuter rail line that's going to go down to New Bedford and Fall River in that area. That's a great opportunity to build all kinds of, of housing like this. This will help lower the cost of living. Now, when you think about how to grow the economy in the 21st century, it really grows because of small and medium-sized businesses. There are big companies that, that do a lot to help, but small and medium-sized businesses are what it's all about. And what affects those businesses more than anything is the cost of health care, the cost of, you know, which they have to provide to their in, their employees. And, and the cost of housing really is part of this because you've got to pay your employees enough that they can afford to work for you. And in Massachusetts, it's just a lot more expensive. It is, and you know this because you were an employer of a small, size, successful business. Yep. And that's what we have a lot of, like, that's what's going good in this area right now. Our businesses, like tech businesses, like the type that you had, like, uh, yep. you know, even we talk about, uh, we've been, Frank and I have been talking about the taxi situation with Uber. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, like, you know, this, these issues become so big because we really need these jobs. Health care, those are expensive you know, for employees. But what about this Uber situation? Let's talk about that. Frank, you want to question? Have Because I know you, you've been yeah, I mean, on this one. So I, you might call me kind of a libertarian, right? Yeah. And so to me, when I see a service like Uber or Lyft or um, Sidecar, Relay Rides or whatever yeah. other you know, particular. And basically, if you don't know, these are new services where you can get transportation on demand through smart devices. And it's much more affordable and smart, and, and it goes outside of the normal taxi license exactly, service. Exactly, exactly. So you don't have to pay a hundred grand to get a medallion. You can just have a smartphone and not be a creep and have a car and then drive around and make a living. But there are unions that would most likely lobby the governor, right, to ban this this sort of... And it just got service. banned, and, and actually it's being proposed to be in banned Cambridge. in Cambridge. Yeah, in Cambridge. They want to make it illegal in right. Cambridge for uh, you to have a business or, or a taxi, tra- a transportation ta- tra- or a transaction with a smart device. That's right. Think about that. Now, now think about how this works, and, and it's, it's amazing, because it's just like everything else we're talking about. If you are a powerful, moneyed group... You get to write laws, essentially, that benefit you and nobody else. So if you've got a taxi medallion and it's honorable work to drive a taxi or to own a fleet of taxis, no question about it, that's a hugely valuable thing to have. And you surely don't want people competing with you who didn't pay for that medallion. And you want to be able to sell that medallion one day. It's a bit like what's been happening with liquor licenses, Yeah, that's another one. Same deal. Those are really, really valuable. 
because they're scarce. So the government, through its form of regulation, creates almost this weird secondary market in these in these things that are really not supposed to be that. They're not so they're supposed to be licenses that give you an idea that this is a is a reputable person. Instead, they become a thing of value. And then when they become a thing of value, they become I don't I don't mean this as corrupt in the sense of here's some money, please pass laws, but they, they corrupt the system because these Unintended people are organized. Unintended consequences. Yeah, and so super services like Uber and Lyft, this is an inherently good thing. People should have cheaper ways to get around. Innovative ways of doing business. This is the kind of stuff you'd think this is what a city like Cambridge should be all about. Now I can't speak to the the, the people that make that decision in Cambridge. That's that's a local decision, but I, but it does reflect something that is happening not just in Cambridge. It's happening in Massachusetts. It's happening all around our country. If you've got the the money and you've got then you've got the influence that that allows you to write policy. It's why when we talk about health care, which we, which I know we did a little bit, groups like Partners that have formed monopolistic entities that are ri- increasing prices, that are hurting consumers. It started under a Republican governor. Charlie Baker, one of my opponents, was Secretary of Health and Human Services when that policy of deregulating the hospital market started. They started merging with each other. They've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Martha Coakley, another one of my opponents, recently allowed partners to buy up another hospital system on the South Shore. How big can they get? They, they I mean, they, get, they, I mean besides huge. owning Mass General and owning uh, Brigham's, I mean, they they're, control they're more than 30% of the market, and they act like it. They're a, mon- they're a monopolist. She approved it. So when we talk about this bipartisan agreement to allow for these kinds of things to happen, which are inherently anti-consumer, anti-small business, they hurt everybody. They hurt the state. They hurt cities and towns that have to pay well, higher How do costs. you answer that because of the high cost of health care? These facilities are going out of business, and the only way to keep them open that's is right. to have partners buy them out. I mean, and, that's the logic that they're using. It's, on these. And, and they're absolutely right, Mike, and that's a great insight. And I would, I would say that that is the system working, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's the system working. You get really big, then and, and then the small take community. Take everyone else out. Every, the small community hospital, the, the, the only way they can, that's right, the only way they can stay them. in business is to, is to lower their prices, makes it, them weaker, and now they have to be bought. And the only thing is left is, hey, partners, hey, we'll help you. This is, this is the systematic problem that's happening in Massachusetts. It can be addressed. So if you were to say instead of the, the, the establishment approach, which is to let the monopolists get bigger. By the way, one of the arguments in favor of allowing partners to buy South Shore hospitals is that partners is a really big employer. So we have to protect really big employers. Oh, of course. But how'd they get that way? <laughs> how'd they get that way? Yeah. Um, if you said no more mergers and we're going to create a, a fee schedule like they've done in Maryland, which, to put it really simply, what it means is you hospitals, you make money. You're allowed to make money. You should make money off of people being healthy, not off of people being sick. If Partners Instead was focused not on how do I get as many people in here, put up more ads on the highway, right, to come here and have surgery, sure. and instead say, I'm going to go work with the community to help people deal with issues of, of their own health so they don't come in to get sick, to get treatment when they're sick, that's a much better system, and we can do that. So as a segue from that, would do you support a single payer system in Massachusetts? I, I don't, and the reason is that, and it's not for philosophical reasons. It's just because I don't think it gets at the real problem. You know, the, the insurance market is already really consolidated. So remember, there's the how you pay for health care, and there's how you deliver health care. And our fundamental problem right now is in how we deliver health care. Every time a hospital raises its price, it gets passed along through the insurance company to the person paying the premium. And the insurance industry is already really regulated. I'm not sitting here to defend them. I'm just saying that if we want to get at the problem, we have to go to, to, the, to the issue with the hospitals. It's a little bit like, and th- this is a, obviously a metaphor, it's a little bit like how I feel about what's going on with people saying Massachusetts should try to get the Olympics. And sometimes people say, hey, we should try to get the Olympics here because it would help us upgrade the T. And I say, well, if you want to upgrade the T, here's an idea for you. Upgrade the T. Yeah, yeah. Right? Don't, don't get the Olympics as a way to upgrade the T. And it's the same thing I feel about single payer. We have to control the rising cost of health care. We've got to change the way health care is paid for. Well, let's go deal with the place where that happens, which is at the hospitals, not on the insurance side. So how do we do that, though? How do we address it without kind of reining in the, the system that is setting prices and, well, and creating exactly we things do. more to be more expensive through like not being able to see a certain doctor needing an approval from this person That's right. so you go see that person like how well, do you it's address a strange that? way they try to reduce the costs is because they say it's impossible to do anything about it so we got to put barriers in everybody's way here's how you do it in Maryland they've been doing this you you would say to the hospital here's a, a bucket of money here's the amount of money that essentially you got last year for example 
you do whatever you want with it. If you want to fill your beds every night and acquire other hospitals and have all kinds of high-paid executives, that's your call. You don't end up losing money. That's your decision. If instead you want to spend your time getting involved in the community and working on public health and make yourself work efficiently, building partnerships with other providers to have people get costs in other settings, then you can do that and you can make lots of money. That's what they're doing in Maryland. That can be done. They call it a global payment system, a fee schedule system, where we get away from the idea of the big people get to pick the prices and everybody else just has to deal with it. So the solution is actually not tremendously complicated. The political will to do it is what's missing. Yeah, and how do you do that in a state like Massachusetts where the governor is, you know, as, as we go through every cycle, we realize that the governor seems to have less and less power. Governor DeVal doesn't seem to be running the state. It seems to be run by the legislature. How does that happen? Some of that's a leadership style, like what I was just describing to you about the transportation law. So if you don't build relationships with people, legislature is really important. They founded our country. They said, you're not going to be able to do anything unless you work together. If you don't get that, you end up stuck. So we have to have people in leadership positions in the governor's office, for sure, that want to work with other people, that want to figure out what win-win solutions look like. I know that the day of the election, when we win, should we win? I need to be on the phone with the speaker. I need to be on the phone with the Senate president to say, we, we, need, to, we need to work together because I, I need them and they need me to make things happen. But that's the style of leadership that, that I think is needed and it's what's missing in politics today. Uh, excellent. And I, I do think that you would bring that. Um, can you win? Can you get in the debates? What are your goals on this? Because this is a big, to run for campaign like this, it's a big thing. Like- we, we can win. I believe we will win. Um, we're already in debates. I do forums with the other candidates all the time. There's an um, independence debate coming up on Tuesday that's going to be streaming online. You can go to the FoulTrack2014.org website. We've got the details there. Am I right? It streams live on Boston Globe. It, it streams live on the Boston Globe's website. Um, there's an independence debate in the fall. They, they're now just starting to organize the debates for the general election. The first one's been organized, the Western Massachusetts Consortium, and I've been in, uh, I'm confirmed to, to participate in that. Um, so we're, we're there. We're in the mix. And it's fun. Yeah, it does seem like you are going to be in the mix here. Oh, man. That's what's so exciting you, about this. When you, when you get to sit up there next to these other candidates and listen to them with the vague platitudes. And you heard, you heard me just talking about health care, right? And, and you'll hear them say, I believe that health care must be affordable and accessible to everybody. And their supporters in the audience clap. And you're listening to that and you say, what, what, do you, what did you just say? The opportunity to sit there next to that and highlight and expose it. Is is just uh, it's so motivating. Must awesome. be a beautiful like just you get scared in the pins and needles. Just you're like, oh, it's my yeah. top. It's fun. <laughs> I mean, look as a as a voter when I listen to them, it's frustrating because I'm like, can you just please answer the question? But as a candidate, I say, can you please keep doing that? <laughs> hey, awesome. I got and, oh, and I think we have some phone call. I think we have a phone call. Uh, wh- wh- what area code are we? Can you turn that down, please. Hello, who's calling? Hi, this is Lucia Fierro. Hey, party. how are you? Hello, Lucia. Thanks for calling. Is this Evan? This is Frank. Oh, Frank. But Evan is live in the studio. Yeah, do you have a question for Evan? I have a couple, but I guess I could just stick with my main one. One's Um, good. All right, well, I love that he's defined the duopoly. That's awesome, and I like uh, challenging the established order. But I hear his name of his plan, Thriving Communities, and it, it reminds me so much of Jill Stein's Massachusetts Coalition for Healthy Communities that you founded and worked in the last decade. And my question is, why start a new party? Why not be Green Rainbow? It sounds like a lot of his stuff is Green Rainbow. I used to be Green Rainbow before I was a pirate. And, you know, I still support a lot of their stuff, obviously. And uh, not that I want to question him for, you know, trying to start a third party because I'm all about that. But you know, I was going to say that as a, as I mean, come on. Party. you started another <laughs> the party. But uh, we'll let Evan answer the question. Thank you very Thank much, you. Thank Lucia. You. Thanks for the question. We it, love you. The problem that we've got is we've got to create the framework for new people to get involved. And I've been on on radio and television shows where people have said, "Hey, you sound like you're a Democrat." You know, I've heard people say, "Hey, you sound like you could be Green Rainbow." I've heard people say, "You sound like a Republican." I've heard people say, "You sound like a Libertarian." I've heard people call me all sorts of things. Something's not so nice. <laughs> but that's the, that's the thing about what's going on in our politics today. Everyone is fixated on saying, which box do you fit in? 
Which box? Well, I'll tell you the box I fit in. My box has labeled on the outside of it, I believe everyone's equal, everybody's civil rights have to be protected, I believe the government has to spend our money wisely, and I've got this crazy belief that people who are running for office should answer questions. You sound like a young jerk. <laughs> a little bit. Because <laughs> that's what I mean. We have, a, a, we, you know, on this show we've had every, I mean, we had the pirate party, yep. we had Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Libertarians, Greens, and now it's officially... United Independent Party. You got it. And I, I, I'm i endorsing you. I, I kind of endorsed you in the dig. Uh, the dig let me know that wasn't an official endorsement from Dig Boston, but it was Mike Cannon's endorsement, <laughs> well, Dig Boston. It was the much. blunt truth. And uh, I think that maybe the dig will give you the endorsement. I'm just right. wondering about like the Globe and the Herald and all these other newspapers. Do you think you'll get some endorsements from these newspapers uh, locally? Well, I'm, I'm working hard every day to earn everybody's vote. And you got to earn them. This is the, this is something that's very important, and including endorsements from papers. I, I, I you hear sometimes people say, "Oh, you, you're taking votes from one side or another." And I tell them, "Look, I, I'm sure both sides are taking votes from me too." But the job of every candidate is to get out there and earn votes. Earn them. You're not entitled to them. You're not here to collect them. I've gone to communities. I, I speak Spanish, and so I, I've gone up to Lawrence quite a lot in Springfield. And when you talk to people in those communities, you hear people say, you know what happens? They, they show up, the statewide office holders, when they want something from you, like a vote. Usually it's a vote, or sometimes it's just a photo op. And then they leave. And then they don't do anything for you. Maybe they do a little bit, just enough, so that when you come back again. And because there are no choices, the, the, um, you know, people don't have a choice of who to vote for, so they don't vote. And some people say, oh, they're apathetic. Or people say, you know what, it's because the other choices are fringe or these people are kooky or whatever it is. But you know what? It's not true. Most people talk like you guys. They're thoughtful. It's they, true. They, it's so true. You know? I mean, even the marijuana thing, for so long people thought that they were alone in thinking that people shouldn't be arrested for marijuana. And then they found out that they weren't alone. That it's the majority. The most powerful thing is when you wake up and realize that you're part of the majority. One other thing to point out, in the, in the, um, the Boston Globe on Friday did a great profile on this campaign, on, on yes, what did. we're doing and what the United Independent Party is all about. It's in that new capital section they have. I really recommend it to your readers to read it because I think they did a great job of capturing that. But you're, you, you make a great point, Mike. When people realize they're in the majority, it's powerful. And so when I tell people, 53% of voters are unenrolled. They're independent. I'm one of them. Yeah. Me too. It's, it's the majority. When you tell people, most people believe the things that I said. Everyone's equal. Everybody's civil rights have to be protected. We need a system that represents people, not these powerful interests. People say, yeah, I feel that way too. Well, all we need are candidates. And that's, that's why I'm running. I thank you for running, Evan. We're, we're, we're almost wrapping up here. And uh, we've had Garrett Kirkland sitting by and... Ross, Ross Bradshaw, we gotta say hello to you. Yeah, thank you, Mike, for letting me sit in. This has been terrific. I was telling Evan, this is such a breath of fresh air to hear this different view. And you know, all the topics that we talked about today, it's just, it's so refreshing to hear this. So you would support at this point, uh, Evan, I for the governor? I definitely would endorse Evan. Thank you. And before this, you didn't really know anything? Not really. You know, I'm one of those folks where, you know, I don't really have a strong opinion on either side, but to hear an individual that speaks up and addresses all the problems, I, I love that. You know, a lot. A lot of times when you talk to politicians or you sit on and you listen to them, it, they seem to just go around in a circle and circle and they don't really tackle the issues, whereas you tackle it head on, and I appreciate that. Thank you. And do you have anything to get, add, uh, Garrett Kirkland, over here about the Thank show? You. Any corrections? So make sure that microphone works. I'm not even sure if it does at this point. Uh, hold on one second. Let's throw on. I can't hear you yet. Throw on some headphones here so I can get myself. Hello. Um, so just to uh, back up towards the beginning half of the show when we talked about the breadth and scope of NSA surveillance, um, it is to call it or categorize it as simply reading emails is a gross understatement. Um, they're tracking Who said that? All right, you, you that, that was our candidate here. Okay, so you th um, you're, you're correcting him. Yes, because okay. the simple fact is that you know they're tracking metadata, locations, who you're associating Do with, you how long you communicate with people. Do you have a question towards that though? Um, no, but I have an I have an underlying point here okay. um, in that you know we can say we can trust in the benevolence of government or not, but the fact is that the FBI was using wiretap information to intimidate the um, Associated Press with it. Um, so spying is a very real danger to the civil liberties. Do you, do you think democracy. the candidate though does recognize that though that uh, well that that's why I'm I'm bringing you it up. And, no, and, it's it's a good. I I appreciate you raising it. I didn't mean to understate it at all. I think you you say it really well. Not enough people understand it. They just don't. 
And, and I think that when I say we get complacent about our civil liberties, these things are happening. And it isn't just in, in Washington. The Attorney General, Martha Coakley, has applied for expanded wireless oh, wiretap yeah. tap surveillance authority. We've been fighting it. Yeah, for crimes, for, for pop, you know, for whatever for it is. For whatever reason. And, and you, you can see, I've, got, I've seen the pictures. Um, the ACLU has actually done some very interesting work on this, of the way in which they, they surveil um, protests. They want to f- take pictures of who's showing yeah. up to these protests. I can't understand what possible rational law enforcement use there is for that. It's such a waste of money, and the feds are definitely doing this, and now the state wants to do it, well, too. Well, what about Stingray? Right. What, what do you the mean? Stingray, Stingray. The, the, the cell phone um, tracking device that the feds have now been implicating in, in, in telling local police agencies to lie to judges right. about the use. And anything like that Would you, you obviously wouldn't support that, right? And right. As and a, and yeah. these, are, these are the things that there, there needs to be exposure and transparency around. And so, and, and look, that's why when I say it's important to have a new party, we need to have a place where you can go where if, you, if, you're, if you're concerned about these issues you'll get a fair hearing. Um, so if people go to, to Falchuk2014.org, if they go to the Evan Falchuk MA Facebook page and like it, they can see these things. Same thing on United Independent Party Facebook page. Uh, and I, I appreciate all your, your time and support, and certainly hope to earn the support of your of your listeners. Thank you so much for coming in today, Evan. Appreciate We're over time. Uh, the Smoking in the Girls' Room show is coming up next. The girls are loudly out there. They're getting ready. They're banging yeah, against they're making glass. A racket. They need to talk about Syria and, and Iraq and all the issues that they get into. Hands off the Middle East. Coming up next on WEMF Radio with the Young Jerks. We'll be back next week. Again, I want to uh, thank Evan Falchuk. For governor and United Independent Party, I'm definitely supporting this campaign. You Thank should you. too. Falcheck 2014org with the Young Jerks. We'll be back next Saturday here yeah. on WEMFRadio.com. <laughs> thank you, Crespo. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dave. Thanks. Awesome job. Thank man. you.